Every 90 seconds, someone is reported missing. Many return to their families. For others, something has gone seriously wrong. A mother has vanished. I immediately thought, my God, Joe, please tell me where you are. Are you safe? Hundreds of lives are in danger. He was saying, I may fly the plane and crash the plane because that's how I'm feeling. He held the knife against her throat, told her he was going to kill her. What happens in the police investigation that follows? You could feel the tension in the interview room. He's either going to shut down now or tell us where Joanna is. What happens to the family at its heart? Joe, we were so close. Let me know if there's an afterlife, please. When missing turns to murder. Well, we came to live in the Isle of Man in 1974, when Jo was 10. She was a lovely, kind-hearted girl. We used to have play dates and things. She would give toys to anybody who came. We had dogs. She loved the dogs. And she loved being out in the countryside. She was just wonderful. Really wonderful. Joe was absolutely potty about the Bay City Rollers. And she would have to undress under the bedclothes so that her hero, Les, wouldn't be able to see her from the poster at the bottom of her bed. <laughs> As an adult, Joe is very driven. She went to a crammer in Oxford, and then she went to Bath University and studied business studies. Joe's career thrives. She falls in love and gets married. I loved the guy she was married to, but sadly it didn't work after three years of marriage. And she was a bit down in the dumps. And a friend who was a purser with British Airways said, come on, I'll cheer you up. Come with me to South Africa. It's here, Joe meets first officer, Robert Brown. Rob sort of swept her off her feet. She rang me and she said, oh, I've met this guy who is really nice. And so I said, oh, good. She then brought him over to the island. And I just disliked him straight away. He was rude arrogant. He didn't come over as a kind person at all. If he made a mistake, he would never apologize for doing anything, ever. Joe's father and I really didn't like him at all. We couldn't understand what she saw in him, to be honest. I found it <laughs> difficult to say to her, I don't really like him. I, I didn't really know whether to or not, to be honest. She saw in him what I couldn't see at all. She was really, I think, a bit on the rebound. Joe's relationship with Robert Brown is a whirlwind. He proposed to her in uh, Hong Kong. And they got married seven weeks later. But before the marriage, her father had told her that he wanted him to sign a prenup because he, he said this is not going to end well. And Rob agreed to do it. Almost instantly, cracks start to appear. Well, after they got married, they went to South Africa for their honeymoon. And she actually told me on her honeymoon she'd made a mistake. He was very rude to the staff in the hotel, and she realized that she'd made a terrible mistake. Despite her reservations, Joe is determined to make her marriage work. 
they got married February the 13th and Jo found she was pregnant in the April and Alex was born in the December. She felt she couldn't leave him and then she got pregnant with Katie. There's only 17 months between them. When she had the children, she thought it better that she wasn't working because of Rob being a long haul pilot. She wanted to be totally on hand mother. The family settled in Ascot. Near to Heathrow for Robert's job. And almost surrounded by the woodlands of Great Windsor Park. So back in the early 2000s, um, my daughter was two and Joe's daughter was two. And they were at nursery together. Alice was invited to Katie's birthday party and off we went on a Saturday afternoon. Joe invited me in and offered me a glass of wine and the rest was history, really. <laughs> Jo was a really sunny person. She was always smiling, she was always really kind, always laughing, and she was very welcoming to everybody. And it was very common. Jo would have five or six different families around the house doing a massive supper, which would happen spontaneously after school pick up. Quite often when you'd phone her, she'd pick the phone up and say, Madhouse. That just symbolises her. She wasn't mad, but she was fun. As well as being that kind of homemaker and someone that brought everybody together, she was also a brilliant individual friend and soulmate. Joe is keen to introduce her friends to Rob. So in the early times when I was getting to know Joe and Rob, Whenever we as friends went over, he would be quite rude to us and quite dismissive, and he would just walk through the kitchen and kind of grunt and keep going. He didn't want anything to do with us, really. It was never a happy marriage. And even then, in those early days, he was always very distant, never used to spend any real quality time with her, and he would go out of his way just to put her down in front of her friends, just make her feel worthless. When I met her, they'd probably only been married a year. When you went around to their house, he was there. You never knew how he was going to react to you. Joe was definitely more relaxed when Rob was not, wasn't around. There was always a tension when he was there. She was a terribly polite person, and I think he, he well, he probably embarrassed her with his rudeness to people, you know, her friends. In the early days, she would generally make excuses for him. She lived and breathed for those children. She wanted them to have a happy upbringing in a family unit, and she would do whatever she had to do to make that real. So for that reason, she would be going out of her way to make excuses for him. But over the years, I think it became harder for Robert Brown to hide his true self. He was just becoming more and more rude, more and more dismissive. When I was there, he would come in, say something, and just this little tear would trickle down her face, which is just heartbreaking. And as that goes on, one of two things are gonna happen. You're either going to sink into the abyss that is what he wants you to do, or you're gonna say, no more. And I think that's what happened with Joe. January 2007 was when she first went to see a solicitor. For her, that was a turning point. Finally, she was starting to take control. That was also the turning point at which things started to get worse and more toxic and, on reflection, more dangerous, because he could see that he was starting to lose control. Rob's behaviour is becoming increasingly erratic. I was over there one evening. Rob was down in Hong Kong, and she got a call from him. 
And then she looked really distressed. He was saying, I'm having really dark thoughts. I've had thoughts of killing you and the children with an ax. I might commit suicide. I may fly the plane and crash the plane because that's how I'm feeling. In the end, she put the phone down and, and she was clearly very, very distressed. She was like, I don't know why he's doing this. And we kind of concluded together that actually it feels like he's saying these things to put more pressure on her to keep things together. So it was horrific, actually. And I was all ready to phone British Airways and tell them they had this kind of psychotic um, pilot on their hands who was going to fly a pain the following day. But she got a friend of his to phone him and then phoned her back and said, he's fine, I've spoken to him, he's completely fine. Which for me completely confirms the fact that it was all a thing to, again, just put more pressure on her. Um, and it had the desired result. Then things take a terrifying turn for Joe. When I'd just been out with my husband, when we got home, we were just going to bed. The phone rang and it was about midnight. And it was Joe on the phone. And there was this little voice on the phone saying, can you come over? And I was like, pardon, you know what? And she just kept repeating, can you come over? So, I was probably there within about 15 minutes. The electric gate was open, the outside lights were on, and she's standing out just in the doorway of the house. She'd been out for the evening with the children. They got back about 10. He was at home, and he helped her put the children to bed. And then he accused her of having an affair, which she denied. and. He was standing with his back to this drawer, and he turned around and he got out the most enormous kitchen knife. He held the knife against her throat, told her he was going to kill her. She said all she could think about was she'd heard somewhere, you know, that you've got to appeal to somebody like this and what they love. And he did love his children. So she was saying, kill me, you know, the children will be without a mother and you'll go to prison. And eventually, he put the knife down. She wouldn't let me call the police. She's like, oh, no, I don't want the children to be disrupted. She just wanted them to have the best life they could. When Jo told me what had happened to her, she was whispering and, um, and she sounded very frightened. And I said to my husband, Joe's been attacked with by Rob, and he said, oh, my God, get her over. And so she got the next plane over. Joe was obviously visibly shaken by what had happened. She said to him, I can't live with you anymore. And that was then when they did start the divorce proceedings. Obviously, there was no way back then. Getting Rob out of her life isn't going to be easy. Joe seemed to think it would be straightforward, but every time Rob was offered some money and told to go, he just wouldn't. Even his lawyer said, you ought to take this and, and leave it. He would not accept the offer. He fought it to the bitter end, hoping to get more money. Joe refused to spend any more time with him because she was fearful of her life but he refused to leave. And so uh, her brother arranged for her to have a bodyguard um, in the house. And that was all they could do other than her leave the house. Eventually, after a long summer, he agreed to a personal commitment not to go near her or the house for 12 months. This was off the back of Joe having applied for an injunction against him. Even then, he would be seen in the garden, just pushing the boundaries. When he dropped the children off after they'd been staying with him, he would just put his foot just inside the doorway, just to make sure she knew 
he had power. Joe was starting, I think, to become more beaten down by it all than I'd ever seen. It had been going on for three years. She couldn't see an end to it. She kind of knew that even once the divorce was over, it would never be over. He would always find a way to get back at her. She was tired of it all. She was really delighted when he got together with his girlfriend and started to make a life with her. And in particular, once she was pregnant, we all breathed a little bit of a sigh of relief because he's hopefully going to move forward and get on with his life. Jo had been here for the first part of half term and I'd taken her to the airport. I kissed Jo at the airport, my very glamorous daughter. <sighs> Sorry. The children are on their way back to Jo after spending half term with Rob. She had made chicken casserole for the children and she had made a chocolate cake for the children. Chicken casserole was their favorite and chocolate cake is their favorite. And they'd been gone for a week, so she'd missed them desperately. The night of Halloween, I'd left this message on Joe's phone. I hadn't heard back from her, but I, actually, I don't think I was particularly worried, to be honest. I went to work the next day and I got a phone call about 10 in the morning from her children's school. I was on the school list if there was a problem to phone me. And they said, oh, do you know where um, Mrs. Brown is? Because uh, the children haven't come into school today. As Joe's whereabouts are starting to be questioned, the police receive a cryptic phone call. Hello, Tom Sully, please. Who's Charles speaking? Yeah, hello. Um, I'd like to, to make an appointment to, to come in um, regarding a, a, an incident that occurred yesterday. OK. Um, Can I ask what the incident was? Um, it, it's of a domestic issue. Right, OK. Our policy for domestic incidents yeah. is usually for an officer to attend within the hour to discuss this. I'd rather come up to the police station as uh, yeah. I've got four children here and I, I, I wouldn't want to, That's fine. That's to, to worry them any further. Um, uh, can you just explain to me what, what the situation is? Well, I, I, I've spoken to my lawyer and yeah. uh, and he said not to, to, to say anything, so... Can I ask um, why he said that? Um, the, the incidents of a serious nature. And the incidents occurred recently? Yes, yes, last night. Right. And you're, you're both OK, are you? Well, well, we have what one, one person is. Right. OK. Is that person seeking any medical attention? Do you know? Do they need it? Uh, uh, no. No. But, uh, 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 I'm going to ask if you can attend the police station. Yep. Um, we'll get an officer to attend there to meet you um, to discuss it. Rob's phone call raises concern for Joe's welfare and the police send a car to her house. They break into the property and notice blood on the stairwell. But Joe is nowhere to be found. Where was she? The children should have been with Joanna. And they were still with the dad. All attempts to locate her at that point um, had, had not been successful. She was missing. I was phoned by this close friend of Joe's, and they said, have you heard from Joe? And I said, no, I haven't heard from Joe this morning. And they said, well, someone's told me there's yellow tape around the house. 
and I immediately thought, my God. So I then started to ring Jo on her mobile, on her house phone, and I'm going, Jo, please tell me where you are. Are you safe? What's happened to you? And we were trying to ring the police, and you know, nobody would tell us anything at all. And I said, God, he's killed her. He's done something to her. I know he has. But, I mean, you say that and you just hope you're wrong. It was probably late morning and I started getting phone calls from Belinda. She was in a terrible state and she just said, she blurted it out, she said, Joe's gone missing. It was a nightmare. And we were thinking, where could she be? At the time, I was a news reporter for the Windsor and Ascot on Ian Express. Went into work on the Monday morning. Uh, first thing, get a communication from Thames Valley Police saying there was a mother of two, 46-year-old from Ascot, who was missing. This is high-value, millionaire, row, lots of big houses, lots of money, small population. A story like this has never happened before. What was unusual about this case was that she should have been at home with the two children and no contact had been made with her. Talking to local people, she was obviously a perfect mother. She wouldn't just disappear. She wouldn't do that to her children. Anyone with half a brain came to the same conclusion that this was not just a missing case, unfortunately. It was going to be something a lot more sinister. Whether she's alive or not, we don't know, but he's definitely got her because there is no way she would have left the children. Sometimes it can take days to get to a point where you're concerned about someone, but very quickly this one became um, concerning. Robert Brown arrives for his appointment at the police station. Robert Brown handed himself into the police station. I'm not sure if he, at that point, thought he was going to be arrested, but straight away he was arrested on suspicion of murder. Robert Brown was very much what I would classify probably as a narcissist. Very quickly it was apparent that he felt that he was of a higher intellect um, than the two girls sat in front of him interviewing him. Despite arresting Brown for murder, the police know there's a chance Joe is still alive. The first interview that we did, it was very direct questions. Where is she? What has happened to her? Is she still alive? We were still hoping that even if Joanna had been badly assaulted, that she may still be alive. The hope was that he had trapped her somewhere, but she was still alive. Even if she was barely alive, I'd take that. First 24 hours of Robert being in custody, it was still very much, where is she? Is she OK? It is an overwhelming sense of urgency and determination because until you actually know somebody is deceased, that there's still a chance they could be alive. And it's just our job to do everything we can. It was really horrible not knowing where she was. But with, with that, that also came the fact that maybe she's still alive. You know, you just think, maybe. Brown made the appointment to speak to police. But he isn't talking. He was very arrogant, even in his silence. 
There was no sense of urgency. There was no emotion. There was nothing. I was getting nothing from him. It was agony. I mean, it must have been real agony for her mother to not know where she is. It's just, it's just the worst thing in the world. They said they couldn't get any information from Brown. All he'd say all the time was no comment. So after that interview, it was very much, OK, let's regroup. Where are we going to go with this? I really believe because of the narcissism that came across with him, that I think letting him talk for a little bit, letting him have his say, letting him feel like he had a bit of control over the interview process was maybe a way that we could get him to just start talking. During this interview process, we're having breaks, just a 10 minute leg stretch, coffee, refreshment. There's just small talk being made. Found out he was a big runner. I certainly wasn't a marathon runner, but I was a runner. It was just a case of building some form of rapport. That little bit of common ground, that lots of positive reinforcement. We were listening. With Rob, it was a ball of just complete disdain. I want to break down that wall, and the only way I was going to do that was letting him be heard. Just having those little bits of common ground. It is all tactical. I'm not trying to be his friend. As Robert's interview continues, outside the station, officers are working hard to find Joe. Family liaison will be with the family, trying to get as much information from family and close friends. Mass search teams that have been pulled together, and then there would be a lot of the house to house. All of this would have been going on at a very fast pace whilst Robert was in custody. The police would come out to report to us what was going on and how he wouldn't disclose where she was. He was a very difficult character to break. But my personal feeling was, you're not superior, you're not more intelligent, you don't understand this process, and even if I've got to do it for the long game, I'm not going to accept not finding Joanna. The police's strategy is working, and Brown is starting to open up in the interview room. Very quickly, it was very much about he was the victim in this bitter divorce and he wanted his say. He wanted his voice to be heard. He was obsessed with the finances. It was like he just felt he'd been robbed. Joanna came from a wealthy family. Robert didn't, but he felt he was entitled to this money and the anger, you, it was tangible. He felt so wronged by Joanna and her family and it was all over money. But police aren't making any headway in finding out where Joe is. The conclusion of day one, I remember going home feeling very deflated. And the intense pressure, personal pressure that I'd put on myself. The thought of not finding Joe, <laughs> it does creep in but my intention was to spin that pressure back on him in a way where we were building up intensity in the interview. It's day two of Robert Brown's police interview. We managed to get him to talk about that day and we were slowly through the day pushing that timeline closer and closer, which is what we wanted to do. But we weren't where we needed to be with him. He still wasn't going to tell us where Joanna was or what happened um, on that, that day. Front page we had on the, the story on the Thursday. The plea for a missing mother, Joe Brown. They released a statement pleading for any information about uh, Joanna um, and 
yeah, that was the front, front page of the paper. You're living in a weird kind of limbo where you are grasping for signs of hope. Because without hope, what's the point? So I went walking with friends in, in Windsor Forest, just hoping we might find some clues. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, because it's like hundreds and hundreds of acres, thousands of acres, probably. And we don't really know where, where we're looking or what we're looking for. I sort of sat in the waiting. I had the hope that maybe she was just injured and that he might have hidden her somewhere and that she may be found. Really dreadful, but I kept as buoyant as I could because of the children. I could feel that that aloofness wasn't there as much. So my, my feeling was that if I could have Robert back in the car with the children, where he's out of the car, dropping the children off at the front door. He's met with Joanne. That's where I, I wanted him to be, in his headspace. And then I started introducing forensic photographs of the hallway where blood splatter had been found. Once he's there, it's very difficult then for him not to move forward. You could feel the tension in the interview room. He just stopped and said, I need to speak to my solicitor. That was it, the interview just stopped. I felt he's either gonna shut down now and we've lost it, no more interviews, or he could tell us where Joanna is and what happened. The investigation is now on a knife edge. His solicitor acknowledged that they were ready to go back into interview. What if he doesn't tell us? What if he does shut down now? How are we ever going to find Joanna? And Robert just completely broke down. He could not stop sobbing. And then confirmed he'd killed Joanna. Robert was able to describe that he'd made the decision that day. He had a hammer that was covered in masking tape and he put it in the children's homework bag. Then drove the children home. Joanna's answered the door. The children have run into the snug area. They were out of sight of the two of them. And then there's been an argument between them. Robert says he took the hammer and hit Joanna repeatedly over the head with the hammer. He's then panicked and he's very quickly managed to put her in the back of his car. He gets the children and he tells them that mummy's not very well and she has to go to the hospital. He then describes how he's driven back to his house with his girlfriend and dropped the children off there. And he's then driven to Windsor Great Park where he's buried her. The police told me that Rob had been taken in handcuffs to where he'd buried Joe. Got tipped off by somebody that the police were searching for a body in the Windsor Great Park on the Crown Estate. So I drove down. I could see the, the police, the flashing um, lights. 
an extensive search has been carried out with the full, you know, with the dogs and everything. You know, there was a big operation going on. And then on the Friday, they came and told us they would have never found her if he hadn't taken them there. They then started extracting the box from the grave and found Joe in it. I then had the job of telling the children that mummy had been found and that she hadn't survived. And I can remember going to Joe's bedroom and looking out, and I'm shouting, Joe, we were so close. Let me know if there's an afterlife, please. I can remember asking if there could possibly be an afterlife. Once we knew that Joe had been found and she was dead, there's a slight relief in a way, at least you know. Because I think that period of time when you are you want to hope, but your heart says there's not much hope, that's an exhausting space to be in. And I also told myself, maybe he dropped the children off, they had a row, he pushed her, she hit her head, and it all kind of unraveled. He panicked. This was the narrative that I had created in my head, which I could cope with. When I learned the truth, which was that she was found in a six foot deep grave in a box, I went into a deep trauma. Suddenly, this was not just some accident. This is something he had planned for months. And that's pure evil. It was absolute shock. The whole community, this is Ascot, this is in the Queen's backyard. This doesn't happen in this kind of area. People were in shock. On the Sunday evening, Joe's friend called me and he had been told the results of the autopsy. And it was really horrific what he'd done to Joe. He bludgeoned her to death with at least 14 blows across her head. Um, her face was disfigured. It was really pretty disgusting. The police take Diana, Hetty, and Joe's children to the burial site. This is where Rob buried Joe. He dug a huge hole in the forest and it was really difficult to get to. It was down a really, really steep bank. Probably took him a long time to do, and it was right under the flight path. So I have an image of him looking down where he was digging this hole uh, when he was flying his plane. It was an autumnal day, um, lots of leaves on the ground, and the children said, oh, oh, we know around here. This is where we used to come and play in the den. The den's just round there. It was near his children's den that he used to take them to, and I think when he used to take them to the den, he used to go off and dig the grave, the grave of their mother. Really dark. It doesn't get much more dark than that. You want to kill your wife, you're going to dig a grave that's six foot deep and you're going to do it at the same time as your children are playing just around the corner. It's just horrible to think that you may never have been found just in that forest. A horrible place really just to be on your own. Robert Brown is remanded in custody, awaiting his trial. So even in the, the interim period between uh, finding the body and charging Robert Brown up until the court case, it was still intense. You know, 
Every day I was thinking about that case. It never left me. This store obviously is like nothing we'd ever had in Windsor or in Ascot, the area before. And it just had its own, you know, snowball effect. It just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Brown's trial begins at Reading Crown Court. The first day he entered his plea and there was just gasps. Everyone just couldn't believe that you can plead not guilty. There was a motive, there was premeditation, there was the planning, the preparation, the pre-dug grave, everything that just pointed to murder. Then just get this not guilty plea, just everyone was just kind of in shock. As he came down from the dock and he looked at the press bench and that look he gave me in the eye just was quite intimidating. There was a lot of aggression there. I sat through the whole trial from start to finish. And unless you've been through a murder trial, you don't know what it's like. You're suddenly in this alien world. I'm suddenly looking at 12 people who are going to pretty much take, make a decision that will dictate the future. I think the prosecution was so confident that they would get this guy for murder and it was cut and shut. It was clear what happened. The prosecution relied heavily on the evidence of planning because not only had he dug a grave months beforehand, but he took a hammer in one of his children's homework bags to the house. And the prosecution lent very heavily on those facts. It's Robert Brown's turn to take the stand. When he gave evidence, it was a big show. He kind of took the courtroom over almost like it was, it was my space. Put a lot of tears, he was in tears about everything. It was clearly crocodile tears, saying, oh, I'm really sorry. And that was the only time I ever heard him say sorry, and it really didn't feel like an apology. It was just purely plain to the jury. The defence had built this big case up that he was the victim. They all tried to pick holes in Jo, her personality and her character. A rich, controlling ex-wife. She had all the control because of the prenup and the money and the house. And life was very difficult for him. Robert was his usual arrogant self. The lies he told were unbelievable. Talking about my daughter as someone I didn't recognise. It wasn't Joe. It was really hard to stomach. You could see the family. You were just sort of looking over the gallery, head in the hands, and just kind of looking at each other, thinking. It's the final day of Robert Brown's court case. The trial was supposed to last for three weeks. It actually lasted for 10 days. Prosecution and defense started their, their closing statements. And at that stage, with the meticulous planning, the premeditation, the motive, the divorce coming up, there was no doubt in our minds of, of you know, what the verdict would be. It was horrific waiting for it. And when those words came out, Robert Brown was found not guilty of murder. Those two words, not guilty, changed everything forever. Robert Brown is found not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter due to adjustment disorder. It was just complete disbelief. I remember seeing the look on the judge's face when the verdict came back and the whole courtroom outside of the jury was just in shock. It was heartbreaking. Thursday, May 26, 2011, 26 years jailed for hammer slaying. Judge throws book at wife killer despite acquittal for murder. We have the killer, Robert Brown, and his victim, Joanna Brown. You know, the judge was in shock. I think that told everything he needs to know. But the judge was in shock, and obviously he gave him the maximum possible sentence he could give him. Just 26 years. He uh, questioned whether the condition known as adjustment disorder could explain his deadly attack. Striking her at least 14 times and the steps she took can only have been done with the intention of killing her. You intended to kill her. 
you intended to conceal her body and the evidence of the killing. A miscarriage of justice, the victim's mother. At first you think, 26 years, oh good. You didn't appreciate that it was half that. You really didn't. And then you think, Christ, that's only 13 years. You don't realize it. Almost 10 years on major crime and dealing with, you know, homicides. And it is still the verdict that I, I, I don't think I'll ever understand how that jury got to that conclusion. That jury not getting the right verdict makes me so angry. When Robert Brown is released in November 2023, the narrative that I cling on to is that he's just like a piece of dust and completely inconsequential to my life. The reality is we're terrified and um, I don't trust him at all in terms of what he will do. A dangerous man is being released and there is nothing anybody can do to stop it from happening. It will always haunt me that Robert Brown didn't serve justice for what he did, but he's certainly not gonna have the money, the status, the superiority. He's never gonna fly a plane again. All of those things have been, that are, I think are really important to Robert, have been stripped. And because of his character, because of his narcissism, that is going to be a very difficult process for him. So, yeah, that's, that's where I, ha I have to fight, kind of find some reconciliation. The consequences of Robert Brown's actions reach far and wide, and his children are left without a mother and a father. Katie and Alex were nine and ten when they came to live with me. Without them, I don't know how I would have coped. They gave me a real purpose, because they were Joe's children. I can't let it rule my life. I've loved having Katie and Alex. Joe's loss was my gain. It's Joanna's grave where we buried her. I find it incredibly comforting to have her here. She just was a really lovely, happy-go-lucky, beautiful a human being. I'm a real firm believer that they never really leave. They continue to walk alongside you. And I think she's, she's always there. All the things that mothers and daughters do, we used to do. And that's what you miss. And there are times when something will happen and just say, oh, I'd love to tell Jo that, you know? And, you know, grief is something you just never get over, ever. But you walk alongside it. I find it very peaceful up here. Um, in fact, I love it. In fact, we're all going to be buried up here.